Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Thompson. I am the director of the Aquarium Seafood for the Future program. Thank you for joining us for this virtual version of our guest lecture series. First, I want to I would like to say thank you to our lecture sponsors, Gazette Newspapers, and Courtyard Marriott. Often when we think of conservation and sustainability, we tend to be hyper-focused on how the environmental and biological sciences can help support the development of solutions that will both maximize benefits and minimize the risks. Leveraging these sciences, we've learned a lot about technologies and innovations that can help us achieve our conservation goals. But at the end of the day, these science-based solutions will only help us if we have public and political support to implement them. We've seen examples right here in California where efforts to restore natural oyster reefs, build infrastructure to protect homes and habitats from sea level rise, or to produce more sustainable and nutritious food locally have been shut down. Not necessarily because the science doesn't bear out their efficacy in terms of providing greater benefits to society and the environment, but because society's perceptions of these activities and associated risks are not always aligned with the science. Without society's approval to conduct these activities, they will not be successful. Social science is critical to help us understand the social, economic, and political dimensions associated with these complex issues so we can garner greater support to su successfully implement important solutions like marine aquaculture to meet the needs of the growing population and the changing climate. That said, tonight I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Luke Fairbanks, who will discuss insights from social sciences for marine aquaculture development in the US. Dr. Fairbanks is an assistant research professor in the Division of Coastal Sciences at the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. As a human geographer and environmental social scientist, his research explores human environmental interactions in the ocean and coastal spaces as well as geographic approaches to understanding environmental policy and management. His work focuses on marine aquaculture, marine spatial planning, and coastal communities, primarily here in the US. Fairbanks earned his PhD in marine science and conservation from Duke University and his Bachelor of Arts degree in environmental studies and economics from Bowdoin College. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Luke Fairbanks. Great, thanks for that introduction. Um, and thanks for <clears throat> the invitation. I'm really, really pleased to do this lecture. Um, unfortunately, couldn't do it in person, but virtual lectures are always fun. And, and I wanted to say thanks again, and thanks to all of you who, who sign on and join to, um, to listen to what I have to say. Um, so yes, my name is Luke Fairbanks. Uh, the title of my talk will be Bridging the Gap, Insights from the Social Sciences for U.S. Marine Aquaculture. Um, I'm an assistant research professor at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, I'll be talking a bit about three different projects I worked on and continue to work on about aquaculture. They kind of span scales from the national to the regional to the local. Um, but first, we'll start a bit with some background to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, raise some questions that we can think about throughout the talk uh, regarding the role of social science and the sorts of things that we might need to know to, um, to develop responsible and sustainable and successful aquaculture. Uh, then we'll go through a few of the examples from the projects I've worked on and, and finish up with some, some brief conclusions. So first off, um, just to ensure that we're all on the same page, kind of a basic definition of aquaculture is the propagation and rearing of aquatic organisms for any commercial, recreational, or public purpose. Um, we'll be focusing mostly on commercial aquaculture, things like raising fish and shellfish for seafood in this talk, uh, particularly in the marine realm. So we'll be talking about marine aquaculture. So you can see here from this graph, this is global uh, fisheries and aquaculture production. Um, really over the past 60 or 70 years or so. And basically what the takeaway is here is that um, capture fishery production has pretty much stagnated uh, over the past couple of decades, but all of that seafood production has been made up for by aquaculture. And right now, probably over half of global seafood production is from aquaculture and about a third or more of that Aquaculture production is marine aquaculture production. So growing seafood in saltwater environments, estuarine environments, 
and off the coast. So here in the US, um, the majority of the seafood consumed in this country, as many of you probably know, is imported. Um, figures ranging upwards of 70, 80, 90% of, of consumed seafood in the US being, being from uh, foreign imports. Um, and approximately half of that is cultured, so it's farmed elsewhere. Um, only one to 3% of the US seafood supply comes from domestic marine aquaculture, so a relatively small uh, fraction. And salmon and oysters are the top two marine culture species in the US, though there are of course many others. So a common question that we have uh, surrounding aquaculture in this country is basically, it's very broad and it's basically just why does it lag behind the rest of the world and many other comparable countries. Um, a lot of explanations have been put forth <clears throat> to explain this and a lot of them focus on broad structural factors. So technical, economic and regulatory barriers. While there's certainly a lot of truth to this, particularly for different species and in different places, um, what I want to point out is what kind of underlies those challenges uh, and what can we learn about them. So uh, as one aquaculture researcher noted just a few years ago, that the political challenges faced by U.S. marine aquaculture are as important as the technical and economic challenges. And I would broaden that, that political to include social and also those social, political, and policy interactions, sort of the nexus of those things. And importantly, these sorts of political and social challenges are often context specific. So instead of just thinking about things broadly, big structural problems that we have to address, really we should be looking also at specific contexts. What sort of species are we dealing with? What sort of communities are we dealing with? Um, who has an interest in the space and in the development of aquaculture at a local level all the way up to the national level? So these are difficult challenges to address they raise a lot of questions and that's the sort of thing that we'll be talking about today. So what are some of these social and political challenges? Um, broadly speaking, the first is often that policies and policy goals are inconsistent with people's wants and needs. And when we're talking about people, we don't just mean stakeholders such as operators or prospective aquaculture operators and farmers, but also the folks that live in the communities that live in the spaces where aquaculture happens where we would think it should happen or maybe it will happen in the future. Um, uh, and as Kim noted in the introduction, we often focus a lot on technological and biological aspects of things like conservation, seafood production. This is especially so with aquaculture. So unfortunately, oftentimes a lack of attention to the social and political context um, means that we overlook a lot of the local social issues that affect development, whether that's concerns and conflicts over siting aquaculture operations, or whether that's kind of perceptions um, of what aquaculture means for the environment or for the seafood supply chain or what have you. So ultimately, a lot of these challenges and a lot of these um, issues that we have can lead to, lead to inequitable development and distribution of benefits when we do develop aquaculture. And this has been seen in a lot of other countries where as policy goals are enacted in specific places, the outcomes for those communities and for those places and for the aquaculture industry more generally can sometimes be unexpected. They can be mixed. They can sometimes cause really negative impacts on local communities or environments. So it's important to try to understand that link between broad policy and local development and kind of everything that's in between. So uh, some scholars, Krauss and colleagues in 2015, they kind of define this as the people policy gap where our policy development processes and our policy goals often take into account a lot of the biological, technical and economic considerations, but overlook some of the social and cultural and political issues that happen across scales. And that can lead to problematic outcomes in the long run. So the question here for this talk is, you know, do we see this in the United States? And um, to get to that and then to, to think of ways that we can address it, I'm going to discuss some of the overarching developments in marine aquaculture recently in the U.S., particularly at the scales of policymaking, and then I'll talk about a few of my projects. So the first thing to note is that over the past 
about two decades, there's been a lot of support for marine aquaculture expansion. Um, this has included the development of federal policies, um, executive orders, and also state level reforms where a lot of states have, have done a lot of work to basically enable leasing of spaces for aquaculture farms and to increase acreage and production in their state waters. More recently, just within the past two years, there's been another uh, bill introduced in, uh, for federal legislation that would rewrite the regulatory system for marine aquaculture in the exclusive economic zone which is beyond state waters and is controlled generally by the federal government. So this would potentially enable new types of aquaculture operations called offshore aquaculture, which I'll discuss later on. This, alongside this, we've also seen new uh, coalitions of industry groups, such as uh, the Stronger America Through Seafood, which has supported development of these sorts of, this sort of legislation and is comprised of a lot of different interested groups and actors, including agriculture and aquaculture firms. And most recently, uh, President Trump has issued a new executive order on promoting American seafood competitiveness and economic growth with a strong focus on things like deregulation, enabling aquaculture and fishing, and a focus on economy and jobs. So in particular, that executive order specifically says that we need a vibrant and competitive seafood industry to create and sustain American jobs, put safe and healthy food on American tables and contribute to the American economy. So these are broad policy goals, very focused on America at large. Similarly, the US Department of Commerce released a strategic plan that covers the next couple of years. And under the strategic goal two, the first objective was to increase aquaculture production as part of the goal to enhance job creation. So I'll just point your attention to these two highlighted statements that note that aquaculture contributes to the seafood supply, supports commercial fisheries and has great growth potential. And in particular, it will serve a key role in US food security and improve our trade balance with other nations. So again, these are really high level policy goals, uh, very aspirational of what the aquaculture industry could do in this country if it were to expand to a significant level and potentially at a significant rate. So with those policy goals in mind, what are the potential risks of that people policy gap? Um, one thing to consider, especially with the focus on jobs and economic growth, is who are those jobs for and where are they concentrating? So will sectoral growth, will aquaculture growth equal jobs and economic growth? Um, and particularly, will they equal jobs for rural communities, often for displaced fishermen? So a lot of times, a rationale for growing aquaculture is that it can help support the seafood industry or at large, or generally, especially those fishermen who've been displaced due to declining fisheries or regulations or financial burden. So a recent paper by Stoll and colleagues that looked at the aquaculture industry in Maine found that despite increasing uh, amounts of permits, uh, licenses for aquaculture over the past 10 years, which you can see in the bar graph, um, encountered the, the prevailing narrative that aquaculture can provide jobs for, the, for fishermen and for the fishing industry. Relatively few people in the fishing sector are participating in marine aquaculture. So this raises the sorts of questions that we need to confront when we think about broad policy goals. What are the actual local regional and state level implications of those goals. Another question is, will we see continued conflicts over development? So conflicts, social conflicts are often at the heart of holding up aquaculture development, leasing and um, expansion. So as just a quick example, this is a line graph that shows the increase in approved and um, applied for leases for, for aquaculture in North Carolina over the past 10 years or so. And those data in the final year in 2018 is actually through only half the year. So it's continued to increase beyond that. So this is a substantial uptick in interest in the industry. But at the same time, in these red lines, you can see that the number of contested leases has also increased alongside that. And contested leases are those that are contested by other stakeholders, for instance, nearby landowners, 
or other users. And these sorts of contestations, um, it takes a long time to sort them out. It can, it can result in costly and lengthy processes for both applicants, for those contesting the leases, and also for a state. So it creates a burden on developing the industry and makes it really challenging to decide where and how to place and site aquaculture operations, especially as more and more are put out onto the water. So beyond these sorts of questions, we also need to think about generally, what are the impacts on the coastal communities where aquaculture happens? Um, what type of aquaculture industry will we see? It can take many different forms from corporate to community-based, and that's something we need to question. And what are we enabling and encouraging when we write policies and new legislation? And it's important to remember that these things are all linked to one another, and they're also linked to broader social, ecological, and geographic systems. So they're linked across places, through knowledge transfer, through people moving, through policies moving from place to place. They're linked through ecological conditions. You know, the oceans, the animals within it, the flora, the fauna, they, they aren't static. They move along the coast from community to community, from place to place. And also things are different geographically, spatially. So aquaculture operations in the Chesapeake Bay are necessarily going to have to be designed differently than they might be in California or Hawaii or the Gulf of Mexico. And those sorts of considerations need to be taken into account from that local level all the way on up to policy decision making so that we can ensure that policies are applicable and reasonable in different places and across space. So how do we study aquaculture social sciences? Well, I argue it should be done at multiple scales from the local community to the national policy making. We should look at multiple entry points. So working with communities, working with industry people, working with regulators and managers. We should also employ multiple methods. So I use in my work interviews, um, surveys, a lot of document analysis, ethnography where I take part in management decision making or in conferences community engagement, where we interact with community members broadly to understand their perceptions and values, and also values assessments, which is we use a mixed qualitative and quantitative method called the Q methodology that I'll discuss later on. So to move on, I'll discuss briefly the first project I'm going to talk about to give a sense of, you know, how does how can we look at the national level policy making for U.S. marine aquaculture? What are the sorts of things that I'm interested in and what can that teach us about how, how policy is made? So here I'm gonna talk about what I call the geographies of national marine aquaculture policy. I'll explain that in a moment. But this work is based on <clears throat> 65 interviews, analyzed over 400 documents. And I also spent time working at NOAA, which is our oceans agency, to get a better sense of how decision making is made there. <clears throat> so this, this national level work focuses on offshore aquaculture. So like I mentioned before, there's state regulations and there's also federal regulations. So basically from the shoreline to three miles out, states take the lead on managing things like aquaculture and from three miles and further, it's considered federal waters, and that's that's where offshore aquaculture is conducted. So the interesting thing about offshore aquaculture is that the what I call the baseline policy framework to participate in it is very piecemeal, very uncertain. There's no single law that governs the the uh, sector. There's multiple agencies involved. Depending on context, there can be dozens of laws in agencies that may have direct or indirect involvement from NOAA, which we discussed, to the um, Environmental Protection Agency regarding Clean Water Act or the Army Corps of Engineers regarding permitting the use of space offshore. So because of, because of these difficulties and the piecemeal nature of things, there's been a lot of efforts to try to reform policy to make it more clarified to move operations and permitting forward. So the first is this idea of administrative cooperation. So this is essentially just take the system we have as tricky and difficult and sometimes confusing it could be, but try to devise ways that we can better understand how coordination works, 
who needs to talk to who, what permits we need to get from what person or from what agency to do our operations, and ultimately try to come up with some sort of model permit that includes very clear coordination amongst agencies and amongst, amongst rules and laws. So the second strand of policy reform has basically been to introduce new federal legislation that would rewrite um, the regulatory system for offshore aquaculture. And this has been proposed a number of times uh, in the mid 2000s and also at the turn of the decade. And as we mentioned before, just recently a new law, their new legislation has been proposed within the last couple of years that would do something similar. And in all these attempts at reform here, um, NOAA is generally put in charge of offshore aquaculture for permitting and development. But I'll also note that they have all failed for a variety of reasons, which is why we still remain in this sort of piecemeal baseline framework. The last um, attempt or strand of policy reform is really using the regional management system we already have for fisheries and applying it to aquaculture. So this map shows our regional fisheries management councils. They're responsible for managing fisheries in their areas. So essentially the, the question is, why can't we use the same system for aquaculture? And that's something that I'll talk about now. So I just wanna show this brief story of what I call policy mobility. So it's the idea that policies aren't really this static individual thing. You don't have your piece of paper that's a policy, but really they're kind of the product of a legacy of policy ideas and efforts across time and space. So to understand kind of how we are in the situation we're in now, I'll show one quick example of this, that it actually starts back in the 1980s with an effort to pre create a huge 50 square mile salmon farm about 25 miles offshore of Massachusetts. And this was done by American Norwegian Fish Farms. This is a foreign firm. They came in and approached the government and basically what happened is the government had no idea what to do. So uh, NOAA went to their lawyers and went to their staff to reassess sort of what their authority would be over something like this that takes up that much space in our ocean environment. And the outcome of that <clears throat> part of that assessment was this really well scanned document that you can see here, which is actually a legal memo um, from NOAA's general counsel discussing what NOAA's legal authority would be to manage offshore aquaculture. And the argument essentially goes that NOAA's leading fish, fish um, sorry, NOAA's leading fisheries law, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, defines fishing as, quote, harvesting. And the legal counsel suggested that harvesting kind of suggests the gathering of a crop and therefore offshore aquaculture, which is essentially the gathering of a crop of fish that you're growing, constitutes fishing. So this sort of legal interpretation laid the groundwork um, for, for NOAA to have some authority over managing offshore aquaculture, even though their laws specifically refer to fishing rather than aquaculture um, specifically with that word. So for a variety of reasons, this Norwegian, American Norwegian fish farm uh, experiment failed. They, it did not get off the ground. And this legal memo kind of went into the files of NOAA for about 10 or 20 years. And then in the mid 2000s, the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico Regional Fisheries Management Council responded to interest in their region to try to develop a plan for offshore aquaculture. So this would be the first fishery management plan for offshore aquaculture in the United States. And they did this by reaching back to that memo that came from a different time and a different place and for very different purposes to essentially set the foundation that they have the responsibility and authority to manage this activity as a form of fishing. So in turn, when the, when the Fisheries Management Council went to NOAA with that plan and that interpretation, the overall agency went through its own reassessment and issued national policies to expand or uh, state to encourage aquaculture expansion in the United States. So what you see here already is sort of this movement across time and place and ideas that includes both a re, uh, sort of a localized effort by American Norwegian that fed back to federal sort of policy and legal interpretation that fed into regional processes that fed back into high level national policies as well. 
And ultimately, those policies led to increased staff and support for aquaculture across the United States, which supported local and regional efforts back in New England, just about 25 miles away from that initial American Norwegian fish farm proposal just over the past decade or so. So it's sort of an interesting story where we can see that policies are not these overarching sort of monolithic static things. There are key moments that you can point to. There's key mobilities about how they move across time and place um, and how they're reinterpreted reinterpre and reinterpreted by different folks. And importantly, that Gulf of Mexico fishery management plan just recently over the past two years was again overturned due to a reinterpretation of the courts that the Magnuson-Stevens Act does not necessarily apply to aquaculture. So again, you have this constant sort of process. It's the idea that policymaking is a processual thing. It's not a static or stagnant thing. And so studying that and understanding that and seeing how it changes and moves and who's involved and where it goes is very critical understanding how policy can be enacted in different places and in different communities and for different aquaculture uh, species and opportunities. So moving from that sort of national level analysis, I'm going to talk a bit about a regional level analysis. So if we go back to that sort of policy map I had up in the previous project, slides uh, and we go to that final box there about the regional efforts back in New England that's what we're going to focus on so we're moving from the national to specific efforts in New England uh, particularly in regards to blue mussel aquaculture so um, this work focuses on perceptions of offshore aquaculture expansion and, and policy amongst stakeholders uh, in New England, it focuses on mussel aquaculture because that's been one of the primary species of interest in New England. It grows well in the cold waters. Um, and it's been attempted in a variety of places. A uh, number of these spots on this map here have been uh, attempts uh, at mussel operations, either pilot projects or sort of small scale commercial projects. And, the, and the, one of the first permitted ones here, number five, which you can see in the, in the top center, um, interestingly enough, is only about 20 to 25 miles away from where that initial American Norwegian salmon permit went in. Went in. So you can kind of get a sense of how sort of the interesting coincidences of how this all works together and see the legacy of the policymaking process really at work even today. So for this work, I conducted interviews, again, did observation ethnography and a lot of document analysis. So what I'm gonna do here is run through uh, the primary results of this work. Um, key things to note is that there were um, six conditions that I generally ask folks about, whether uh, technical, environmental, market, regulatory, financial, and social political conditions were favorable or not to offshore aquaculture policy and expansion in New England, with particularly in relation to mussels. Um, and I also interviewed 41 informants, um, those listed as the O on the left side of the informant uh, section were people involved in operations and development of aquaculture and, and P were people more involved in policy and regulation. Though there's often overlap in those distinctions. So briefly, the first thing to note is that technical environmental and market conditions were generally considered favorable kind of across groups. Um, and this was somewhat to be expected as discussed in some of the earlier slides. We've come a long way in developing aquaculture, even in offshore environments, but particularly for mussels. So a lot of technical kinks have been worked out. Um, similarly, environmental conditions for this sort of operation in New England are quite favorable as mussels generally thrive in the sort of offshore waters of the region. And lastly, we know quite a bit about the seafood market, particularly in those states and for that product. So there were very little, very few concerns that the market would be an issue for offshore aquaculture expansion. The second two um, sets of conditions related to regulatory and financial 
And maybe as expected, these were often considered problematic and uh, apologies for the, the red line is on the NA, it should be on the problematic uh, answers. But the point here is that regulatory issues are often considered a huge hindrance to developing this industry. Um, it's very difficult to navigate uh, even as we move forward and try to find some more of those some more of those uh, key points of communication and coordination. And so it can be very lengthy, very costly. One informant told me just to get a permit for offshore aquaculture in state waters, which is typically considered easier than federal waters. It took years and tens of thousands of dollars. And that wasn't necessarily an outlier. Others uh, have had similar experiences. So that presents a key barrier and related to that is a financial barrier. Aquaculture, particularly in the offshore environment can be costly. You need to raise capital. You need to have some, ideally some sense of security with the tenure, with the lease that you have or the space that you're using. So these things can create a financial burden, particularly if you're unable to take a permit or a lease or whatever you're able to get from government agencies and use that to get a loan, which is, is often needed, but difficult to, to secure. So those financial and regulatory issues were often considered problematic and still are even since this research was conducted and they're also linked together. So it's important to remember that. And lastly, I wanna point out the social and political conditions. And here we saw more mixed responses. So I think what's going on here is that on the one hand, there's a view that if you move further offshore, you're moving further away from people and different uses and potential conflicts. So in that sense, a lot of folks might think that offshore aquaculture expansion is um, favorable or at the worst neutral and mixed. And again, sorry for the, the yellow box should be up a bit higher in that highlighting the favorable as well, which is kind of comparable to some of the other answers we, that, uh, that I received. So on the one hand, there's a sense that you go further offshore, you run into further issues and further conflicts. But on the other hand, offshore environment is often deceivingly busy. There's a lot of different activities from shipping to fishing. And there's a lot of different regulatory areas or closed areas for shipping lanes or conservation zones or whatever it may be. So those sorts of social and political challenges don't necessarily go away just by moving further offshore. And on top of that, a lot of folks pointed to just sort of problematic social issues when it comes to social perceptions of aquaculture, what aquaculture and seafood means or represents to different people. Um, and those sorts of perceptions, whether they are based in reality or not, or are informed or not, do matter when it comes to things like citing aquaculture operations where there's often public comment and the public involved. So it's important, and, and these results show that those social and political conditions aren't quite as easy to navigate as you may think, even in an offshore space where there is no, you know, nearby coastal landowner that can see these operations next door to their house. So one key, a couple of key insights I want to note from this work is that these perceptions are useful because they can help guide us toward potential paths forward. So for instance, um, Those ideas of uh, that financial and regulatory constraints are challenging, a lot of informants suggested that maybe one way around that is to better uh, cooperate with one another. So thinking about community-based and cooperative aquaculture initiatives where people can share costs, share labor, and work together. And furthermore, those sorts of initiatives, if they're based in community and in community discussions or amongst different stakeholders within a community, it might be a way to alleviate some of the social and political concerns because there could be more buy-in at the local community level. Um, similarly, because there's so many challenges with understanding the regulatory process itself, maybe one way forward that was often suggested is not so much to focus a ton of effort on rewriting laws at a huge, at a large national scale or even at a regional scale, but to put federal and state resources to more 
um, targeted and non-regulatory interventions. So just helping with coordination, educating um, uh, people on how to go about doing aquaculture and working with uh, local and regional stakeholders to do things like informal planning discussions that might happen before or, or aside from any regulatory discussions. So just trying to understand where different things happen, where there might be good spaces for aquaculture and finding out, uh, opportunities of consensus to move forward with the industry. So now I'm gonna zero in a little bit more on uh, uh, further into local concerns with a, a more recent project that I've worked on, um, on seafood values and coastal community well-being in North Carolina. Um, this was led by colleagues at Duke alongside others at the Coastal Studies Institute and the University of Maine. And what we were interested in here was understanding the values and attitudes that people hold toward seafood production, um, particularly in regards to change changes in the aquaculture industry because in North Carolina there's been a lot of interest in growing the industry both at the state level and the policy level and also amongst uh, the industry itself and prospective industry members. So just to give you some context on where this research occurs um, there's your maps in North Carolina on the left and in the middle. Uh, most of this work was in Carter County and the part of it called Down East Carter County which is easternmost part of the county. It's a very traditional uh, fishing region, multi-generational uh, families that have lived there for a very long time, participated in fishing, boat building, um, waterfowl industries. It has a, a very strong heritage about working on the water and living on the water. So here's a few photos of the sort of fishing that goes on down there. On the top left is pound netting for Menhaden. On the bottom left is um, gill netting for flounder. So these are sort of small scale operations, but they're really the, uh, an important, important component of the local community and also the local geography. So that's kind of juxtaposed by interest in growing the aquaculture industry. Now there's already some aquaculture, but not much in North Carolina, primarily oyster aquaculture. So there's been new legislation introduced and passed to grow the industry and a uh, government report has projections to increase production 10, tenfold by 2030 to $33 million of farm gate value and $100 million of total market value. So that's quite a substantial projection or goal. Um, it's unclear if that will happen, but regardless, the point being is there's a lot of interest in growth of the sector and it's got support from multiple uh, elements of the state, including industry, policymakers, and many other stakeholders as well. So we were interested here in, you know, what do people think about this? Because like we've talked about throughout this, this lecture, you know, what happens at the local level really can dictate how aquaculture actually develops and what it means for those people that live there. So to conduct this work, it was carried, it's been carried out in three phases. The first is we aggregated a qualitative database of over 500 files, oral history information, regulatory meeting minutes, and other files like that. The second is we conducted 42 Q sorts. Uh, Q is a mixed method um, to understand people's values and attitudes. It's basically a sorting activity that I'll discuss shortly. And then we also conducted a consumer survey and some of those results just came back and I'll very briefly uh, give a taste of, of what we saw in those results. So I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time on the methods, but I do think there's value here so that um, we can see you know, what goes into understanding these sorts of processes. How do we actually study it? And there's a lot to the nuts and bolts. It's not particularly exciting. I mean, it's exciting to me. It's not exciting to most people. But I will show kind of how we walk through the process to give a sense of what are the different ways we can approach social, social science research in regards to aquaculture. So as I mentioned, the first phase was this qualitative database. And I just have a picture here that kind of shows basically on the right side, a whole lot of different themes. So we took these 500 plus files and coded them to different themes that were related to issues of change and issues of values that people have in the community. So that can be about governance. It can be about 
politics or property rights or aquaculture or economics. And the idea is that by going through this iterative process of coding and recoding and understanding what sort of issues are really at play amongst the um, population, we can take that to develop short, sort of a short stack of statements from that database that represents generally kind of what you might consider the universe of values that people have about seafood and aquaculture production in the region. And that's the first step of phase two, which is the development of our Q methodology. Um, and here's a picture of us working to, we have all different statements cut apart. We're trying to decipher which ones are the most important to keep and use in the method and which can be discarded. And this sort of process we went through multiple times until we arrived at this short stack of about 40 statements. So what we do here is we ask participants to take that stack and sort it in this sort of uh, pyramid distribution. Those set put on the left are least how they think and those put on the right are most how they think. And it seems like a somewhat simple exercise, but because you're forced to distribute these things in particular ways, it really makes, you make, makes people make kind of difficult decisions about what uh, is more like how they think, particularly in relation to one another. So a lot of people generally enjoy this method. It's a bit different from just filling out a survey and it's also leads to quite interesting discussions afterwards. So we conducted this with um, folks at their places of business, uh, at community meetings, um, with individuals and in groups. And then we'd often do debrief interviews afterwards so they could explain to us why they put things where they did. Um, so we could understand not just the distribution of people's values, but also the rationale behind them. And we worked with a community partner, um, the Coruscant and Waterfowl Museum and Heritage Center in the region to really help us uh, work with the community and conduct this method there. And I think it really helps to get that sort of community buy-in to, to conduct this social science research and then ultimately to do um, actual applied development of things like aquaculture. So I'm not gonna discuss this. Essentially all that needs to be known is you take all of those completed sorts which are transcribed onto these forms and you run what's called a factor analysis and that shows us how the different values group together generally across the participants in the population. So the way that those different sets of values group together basically shows us what broad perspectives are. So not only do we know where individual value statements are placed, but we know how they typically relate to one another. And we can kind of discern a, a set of broad perspectives that exist in uh, regarding the issue. So in our research, we found that the statements kind of clustered into these perspectives. The first is the aquaculture preservationist. Uh, the key points there is that seafood production is prominent in that view and aquaculture should be conducted for the benefit of the communities themselves. The second is the ecological aquaculturist. And the summary points here is that aquaculture is very prominent in this view. The science and environmental benefits of aquaculture, particularly from shellfish aquaculture are prominent and fish, on the other hand, is considered problematic. The ne next perspective is the aquaculture pessimist. This is somewhat opposite of the previous in that fishing is most prominent and fishing is subject to outside forces like overregulation or uh, foreign competition and aquaculture is a problematic activity. And the last one is the aquaculture minimalist. And the idea here is that fishing is still the most prominent but aquaculture can fit in as long is it uh, focuses on local rights to access and, and produce seafood. So the key here is really that local rights to access and produce seafood, ideally for fishing, but also potentially for aquaculture. And these, these four perspectives explain quite a bit of the data we collected um, uh, to a degree which suggests that, that these are uh, real and useful and valid results. So we were pretty happy with this. Um, so just to give you a sense of how this works, essentially we get the, the uh, different perspectives have sort of different uh, key statements and each statement has a number. So these are for this first row, it's the five statements that are most like the way I think for each of those 
perspectives, and then five statements that are least like the way I think. And there's also a number of statements that are kind of just distinguishing. They differ significantly from the others, but didn't necessarily come out on that left or right of the sorting exercise. So to give you an example, we can look at this statement. Shellfish and mariculture is really a win-win-win. It's good for the environment. You're able to produce stuff that's good to eat, and it creates good revenue for a grower. Now, for the aquaculture preservationists, this was very much like how they think. And for the pessimists, it was not so much. It was at least like the way they think. And that really shows kind of what is a key area of disagreement between these perspectives. So if we're going to have management or policy discussions, where are the things that we need to understand there's already disagreement and that maybe we could try to mediate? As another statement about stewardship, we could look at this number 28. So when we're talking about our waters, stewardship is more important than seafood production. We have to protect our resources first. So this is interesting because it fell closer to more like the way I think for, the, for uh, perspectives two, three, and four. So all of them had that rated relatively highly for more like the way I think and it was only lower for the first perspective, the aquaculture preservationist. So if we take these sorts of examples of specific statements and placements, they can kind of lead us to some insights. You know, where can we start our discussions about aquaculture? Well, maybe instead of thinking about pro-development versus pro-conservation or pro-fishing versus pro-aquaculture, we could go back to that last statement, for instance, and see that there's actually pretty wide appeal for stewardship. Now, it might be stewardship in different forms, but both of those that are very much um, enthusiastic about aquaculture and those that are very much enthusiastic about maintaining fishing and, li and very and limiting aquaculture think that stewardship is important. So that could be the sort of uh, point of consensus that we could build discussions around rather than coming into aquaculture discussions with preconceived notions, battle lines, and adversarial attitudes. So the third phase of this work, we just got back some of the results. This was a survey that focused on the consumer side of things. So that Q work, Q method work was looking at sort of the producing, the seafood producing communities, and this looked at consumers. So a thousand consumers in North Carolina, and we asked them questions related to their seafood preferences, including farm versus wild, as well as some of those questions about regulations, policy, and um, coastal community values. So I'll just show, want to show one result because it speaks back to that people policy gap that we talked about at the beginning of this, uh, of this talk. So these are the top three considerations for respondents when managing mariculture in North Carolina. And I thought this was really striking because the top three things were protecting small and family businesses, environmental sustainability, and fair wages for producers. So this right off the bat kind of diverges with some of those key policy goals we often see um, used as rationale at very high levels of government. So food security was the fourth uh, consideration, but statewide economic development and addressing the U.S. seafood trade deficit were both relatively far down, especially compared to the top two and three uh, considerations here. So when we talk about policy goals that put these really broad high level uh, rationale behind things like aquaculture expansion, it's important to go back and really interrogate whether those things resonate and, and are meaningful to people, whether it's consumers or the coastal communities where aquaculture will happen. Um, and I think that this data, which just came in, shows an interesting uh, sort of divergence there that we can already pick up on. So like I mentioned just then, we have to think about that con the consistency with policy and also with our with stakeholders. Um, and this sort of research can provide basic and applied insights. There's a lot of interesting social science questions about how values and attitudes and perceptions matter in people's behavior and in policy development. But also there's very clear applied insights about where we can start policy discussions, how we might consider reworking aquaculture to be more um, beneficial to communities and to different levels of um, you know, community organization, whether it's in re regional or state level. So I just want to know that we're now we're taking this some of those methods and we're kind of enrolling them and building on them to do a comparative approach across Maine, North Carolina, and Florida, focusing specifically 
on the social dimensions of aquaculture um, and less so on other forms of seafood production. And we're looking to do this by doing our methods online, survey and the Q method, hoping that we can come up with sort of a generalizable tool so that we can do this sort of social science research and assessment in a relatively straightforward way. And it could be used in other places to help us better understand these social dimensions of aquaculture um, moving forward. So lastly, I just wanna mention a few key insights I hope we can draw from this work. Um, and really it comes down to that question that was brought up at the beginning. How do we bridge the gap, that people policy gap? Um, first, I hope that I showed that there's a the real value here of social and policy science for aquaculture. We really need more of this. Um, it's very important in a basic sense and also an applied sense. And I think that there is the, you know, there's good support for this sort of work out there, but there's always room for more interested researchers and students and, and folks, members of the public as well. The second is that it's important to interrogate those big picture policy goals. You know, what are their effects across scales? How do they relate across scales? How are they consistent or not with the places and people that are actually involved in an industry like aquaculture that live nearby or within aquaculture development areas. So as a result, what I suggest is that we really can't lose sight of the who, where, and how of marine aquaculture. Um, we can't think of aquaculture expansion sort of as an abstract, abstract concept that just happens. Aquaculture just grows. There's more industry, there's more business. We need to think about where are those effects? Where is a farm placed? Um, who is working there? And what does it mean to those people? And similarly, those broad scale benefits that are often used to justify or as rationale for aquaculture, while important, they do not necessarily trickle down to the coastal people in places where it happens. So if we're talking about growing aquaculture for jobs or food security or for improving um, our trade relations, we need to also think about what that means for the actual people involved. So broadly speaking, I think uh, a, key, a key way forward is to work toward well-being, to understanding well-being in all its facets for successful, sustainable, and responsible marine aquaculture growth. So this includes economic and ecological well-being, as well as social, political, and cultural well-being. And I think social science can help us get there. So ultimately, what we want to ask ourselves as we move forward in this country and developing a sustainable and responsible aquaculture sector is we have to ask aquaculture for whom? What are our goals? Who's benefiting? Who may be losing? And how can we address those things so that it can be mutually beneficial, ideally for all that are involved? And with that, I'll just point out some of my collaborators and folks that have helped along the way, as well as our funders. Um, and I've really enjoyed giving this lecture and uh, thank you for listening. You can contact me at my website or by email and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or discuss this further. All right, Luke, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I'm a little biased because we work on social license and perceptions quite a bit here at the aquarium through our Seafood for the Future program. Um, but I should mention to the audience, we really, um, I wish you're all here to give Luke a huge round of applause because um, this has been quite an undertaking. He was actually supposed to speak months ago, but we've been derailed by hurricanes. And then recently today when we started to record this, we had a fire alarm, which we meant we had to exit the building. So Luke, thank you for hanging in there. Um, it was well worth the wait. Um, uh, and as you mentioned, you know, social science is so critical and it's something that often gets overlooked again in the broader a uh, picture of conservation, but also then we're talking about expanding and growing a sustainable blue economy. And as you pointed out, you know, we have to look at who's being affected, how they're being affected. And it's also very important to understand how these development projects will directly and indirectly impact the local communities and then also expand that out to then what is the greater good for society and the environment? How do the, the local needs versus the global needs interconnect and when what's the interplay there um so one of the things that i wanted to 
ask you about is, you know, and this is a really tough question because we want to support the local communities. We want to understand how this can either benefit them or impact them, and that's very important. But we also have to take a step back and we have to look at the bigger, broader societal impacts of not doing some of these activities. And I'm going to use California as an example. So California, we know from an ecological standpoint, we have a lot of waters that are um, really conducive to responsible marine aquaculture production offshore. We're also one of the largest consumers of meat on the planet, and we also produce a lot of meat right here in our state. So one could argue that we do have a, an ethical obligation to take on some of that responsibility for the production in our own backyard. However, our local communities are often reticent to accept that. They don't want the aquaculture in their backyard. Um, and then in, in some ways, they may have very good reasons for that. But how, what would your recommendation be for, for reconciling that? Or how can we go about starting to, you know, from a social science point of view, how can we start to learn more about these conflicting interests and how we navigate those? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question um, because it's one of these things where if you ask people in a vacuum, you know, do you support more, you know, sustainable aquaculture, most people would probably say yes. But then when you give them a list of other things to choose from, including conservation or other activities, it, something like sustainable aquaculture might often find itself relatively far down the list. So when push comes to shove, it's a bit frozen out. Um, the question of how to address those sorts of uh, difficulties and, and conflicts is, is tricky um, because we can do, you know, some of the research that, that I've been a part of that I presented on here to try to elucidate, you know, where people's values truly lie, uh, what are maybe overarching values, value systems that kind of link across different issues like conservation or aquaculture development. And doing that sort of work can help point to those, um, you know, those opportunities for consensus. I think there's a lot to be said for maybe more um, kind of ecologically focused aquaculture operations. For instance, I didn't talk about in this, this discussion much about restoration aquaculture. There's a strong movement towards restoration aquaculture, primarily not for harvest or commercial benefit, but to improve environmental conditions. But maybe there's, there's opportunities and ways to sort of link those things together through um, you know, integrated aquaculture systems that both have clear environmental benefits, not just being benign in the environment, but providing benefits and restoration benefits, and also providing um, commercially available seafood. And these sorts of different operations and also different ways to start conversation could be ways forward that hopefully, you know, could help. Um, it's not necessarily, I don't know about always changing minds, it's just maybe broadening the conversation, what goes into aquaculture and what it actually entails. And, and I think we can all agree, it's just, it's complicated. But I, I think this is where social science really comes into play. And I think you're right, I think it's, it's just, furthering that understanding and getting more funding to the social research side so we can better understand what those divides are and then how we can better communicate and meet people where they are, right? Yeah. Um, so you also mentioned the, the Stoll study, um, and forgive me, it's been a while since I've read it. <laughs> But you know, as you mentioned, what it basically demonstrated was in Maine, what it showed was relative to the number of permits for marine aquaculture, there were relatively few fishermen who were actually employed um, at these aquaculture operations. So one thing that I did wonder, I remember though when I read that paper though, so it, it looks at the, the current landscape in terms of you know, what fishermen are hired, but is part of that, though, again, kind of that pushback on fishermen, kind of that stigma that they have with aquaculture, that it might compete with us and it might take away our opportunity to harvest wild seafood or it might compete with us in the market? And is there potential then, you know, as more and more aquaculture gets underway and the relationships are built with fishermen in a positive way, and we have seen this in Maine with some of the seaweed and lobster, where the lobster fishermen can harvest seaweed or farm and harvest seaweed in the off-season, 
Do you think that there's potential then where that number could start to shift in terms of fishermen who are actually benefiting from marine aquaculture um, directly through employment? Yeah, I do. I think it's a good point. I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for, um, uh, you know, uh, Josh Soule and his colleagues and uh, in, in their research out there in Maine, but I will, you know, I can't talk about this in relation to what I've seen myself in New England and North Carolina and other places um, where there is, there does seem to be a shift in perspectives. Um, this case in North Carolina that I talked about and the down east area is maybe a, a good example of this. That's a, a region with a very strong fishing heritage and for a long time was extremely against any form of aquaculture, um, with the exception of maybe just a couple that are sort of longtime families that had been grandfathered in. Um, now there's definitely a shift, at least in, in some segments of the population, which was shown a bit in our data. Uh, and also shown in the permit applications themselves, where they're coming from, who they're coming from. And I think it might, you know, there's, people have suggested a variety of reasons. One is kind of a generational shift where younger participants might be more open to moving from fishing to farming. Um, another is maybe just a broadening of perspectives of what seafood production is. It doesn't have to just be fishing and the benefits that could flow from aquaculture, not just economic benefits, but community benefits in terms of community cohesion, um, maintaining a tradition of working on the water could potentially also flow from aquaculture operations, especially if they are small, um, smaller family owned, which is often a key point made by folks in these communities. So I do think that there is some transition there um, and there's also probably potential for more transition there's a lot of arguments that there could be sort of a um, snowball effect, especially as some people that transition into the sector are successful financially in particular, that it could become more attractive to others to get involved. And I think we've seen some of that already in a variety of states. Um, the question is, I guess, whether that some of those things you were discussing, just the reticence in general to change industries can be overcome. And on top of that, it's not there. I think that there's often a perception that fishermen are ideal candidates to engage in aquaculture because they already have a lot of experience working on the water on working with similar gear. So it's a natural transition. And I don't really know if that's always the case. It's, it is a very different industry. It's a very different mindset. Um, it's a very different experience on a day to day basis. And also some of the gear is quite different. So there still needs to be efforts to, you know, engage in training or education or, or community or co-op programs that can help people make that transition if they're interested in doing it. So that actually goes to my next question. So you had mentioned with the government resources. So instead of, you know, focusing, so we've been told this too, right? Whenever you talk to a legislator about making change, they're automatically removed to making new legislation, which we know could actually not be what's needed and it could actually make things worse depending on you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, so you kind of touched upon those you know, targeted non-regulatory um, discussions versus new regs. And I think you started to kind of allude to even programs like training people to, um, to adapt to marine aquaculture, not necessarily just fishermen, but people within the community so that they can actually benefit directly. So can you elaborate a little bit more on what some of those non-regulatory services might be? Yeah, sure. I think um, some states have shown pretty good success in, do, in um, doing a lot of pre-permitting activities. So these would be things that are you know, related to regulations, you have to get your permit to conduct an operation, but they're kind of held before any of the formal paperwork is really filed. So finding ways to get different stakeholders together, including the interested operator and folks that may live nearby or have strong views on aquaculture, um, get them talking. This can help with things like siting, uh, so determining where to put the farms. It can also help with things just like knowledge exchange, understanding what aquaculture is, what it looks like, what it might provide to the local community. So that's one example. Um, other examples could be things like training programs and transition programs. Um, those have been used in some states 
with varying degrees of success. Again, that doesn't rely on changing regulations or making new laws. It just provides resources to help people really get involved and interested in the industry um, and, and, and grow it ultimately. So those are, you know, a few, uh, two examples. And then the last one that I touched on a bit in the talk is maybe providing more support for community-based or cooperative aquaculture ventures. So not just, um, not just kind of assuming that aquaculture operations have to be your standard business or corporate model, but maybe providing information, um, providing insights on how people can work together to share costs or share labor or to develop aquaculture that's beneficial for more than just a single operator or business. So another thing that you and I had uh, talked about uh, yesterday in the, in the test run um, was the executive order and the um, economic, economic opportunity zones. And I was really excited when I was kind of reviewing your work and seeing that you're this perfect storm of working in the regulatory space. You've done marine spatial planning work, and of course you're working with aquaculture and social perceptions. Um, so I was hoping you could, you know, A, explain just kind of a high level overview of what the idea behind these uh, economic opportunity zones is. And then from your perspective and your experience with your research from the socio-political standpoint, you know, do you think that could be a useful tool in moving things forward um, or, or not? I, I would love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, the, the um, opportunity zones is, is an interesting concept. It's kind of been deployed in, with different names and in different forms in a variety of places. Um, and as you mentioned, excuse me, as you mentioned, it was kind of one of the pieces of the executive order was to set up these opportunity zones and encourage their use. Um, they, the, the basic idea behind them is that as we talked about during the lecture, it, it can be very difficult to get a permit. It's hard to find space that is um, open, that uh, other stakeholders don't have significant conflicts with, and that's actually productive and would lead to a profitable business. So if you can pre-permit space with government support, so if the government, uh, whether state or federal could delineate certain spaces that are ideal conditions that are agreeable to other uses and avoid uh, a lot of different types of conflicts that could impede permitting, then that space could be uh, essentially pre-permitted by the government. Uh, your environmental impact statement could be conducted beforehand. It could kind of be programmatic for that area. Um, and then interested operators could essentially in some way or another apply to work in that pre-permitted space. So there's potentially a lot of benefits there. Um, it cuts through some of the paperwork. It removes some of that paperwork burden from interested operators. It also can provide a way to perhaps get um, entrepreneurs or first time operators uh, involved in the industry, they might be able to lease small amounts of spaces and opportunity zones. That's been kind of the idea in some states. Um, it could also provide sort of clustering benefits, which is something we see in a lot of other economic sectors where similar businesses or industries, you know, when they're nearby, they can um, kind of build upon each other, share resources, share knowledge. This is why we have business parks or, or things like that. Um, and then at a federal level in offshore waters where you might need more capital and things like that, it can really potentially um, lower that regulatory and financial burden to developing your operation offshore. Um, there's a lot of questions about, again, determining what that space would be, who would be uh, you know, allowed to use it, um, how long they could use it, um, how new users could get involved. So I think there's still questions to be asked, but still it's kind of an innovative uh, idea, at least for the United States, interesting. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess we'll see how it develops and it's already developed in a few states um, with some success. And to clarify, and, and you mentioned this, right? So within that zone, the environmental impact statement still has to be created. So they're not necessarily sidestepping environmental regulations. It's just being done in a more, uh, 
in a bigger, maybe more efficient way, right? At less cost to the producers. Yeah, as I understand it, that's the idea. None of something like that, especially through an executive order, an executive order doesn't change legislations or regulation per se. Um, so you still have to abide by the laws on the books and, and carry out those things and get those necessary permits. The idea is just that you can do it in a more efficient way where there's closer communication and perhaps a little bit more government support. Um, so that's similar to things like marine spatial planning in the United States where it doesn't necessarily create or doesn't create new authorities or regulations, but it provides ways to do planning within the bounds, within the laws and the agency responsibilities and authorities that we already have. Great. Well, Luke, I want to thank you so much for joining us and thank you for hanging in there through the hurricanes and the emergency evacuations. <laughs> um, we greatly appreciate you participating. Um, and for everyone out there, this will be recorded. It's online, so we'll be airing it at 7 p.m. tonight. Um, but then you can look for it on the Aquarium in the Pacific's uh, website and YouTube page. Please join us for our next virtual lecture on July 8th when John Sabo will be here to discuss food security and dams in the Mekong River. Uh, you can visit aquariumofpacific.org lectures for more information. Thank you.